Hey, hey, Facebook friends and family. Welcome to Border Lore Live on this fabulous June 19th, AKA Juneteenth for the Black Collective. First, let me start by giving props to our wonderful god of tech, Kate Williams. Um, I am your host, Adiba Nelson, and I will be speaking to Tucson's very own, and dare I say, legendary Barbia Williams. And I am also being joined by ASL interpreter, Candace Whitlow. Thank you so much, Candace and Barbia. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So um, for those of us that don't know out here in Facebook land, you have been teaching African dance here in Tucson for 44 years. Yes, yes. That is amazing. We, Where did you start? We started at uh, the Tucson um, Parks and Recreations. I had been dancing downtown at the Old Fellows Hall with um, Olivia Rojo and uh, Rebecca Garrell and just some other wonderful, wonderful people. And um, I think Becky was working at Parks and Rec and I got a call and asked me to teach. And so I, um, I got a book. I'm not sure who it was by, but it was like how to teach dance. <laughs> <laughs> that was basically exactly what it was. It was a book about how to teach dance. We had been working, um, we had been working with um, uh, Barbara Greenberg Gatek uh, with the Afro-Cuban, what she called Afro-Cuban dance, which I, as as I continue to study and grow in my knowledge and um, and awareness of various influences of African-centered dance, I realized it was it was none other than the technique of huh. Catherine Dunham. <laughs> That's what she was teaching. The and the more I, um, you know, again, I, you know, began to attend conferences and um, uh, just get in touch with people worldwide that um, I began to, um, really understand what I was doing. And we started off by calling it Afro dance right. because I did not want to be respectful. And in saying that, I really want to start by um, just um, giving, you know, paying homage to the ancestors and um, really thanking them for, again, choosing me because this was uh, not my direction <laughs> that I was going in. Right. Uh, as a young person, I always loved to dance. My mother was a dancer. And so I grew up dancing. My sisters and, you know, our family, we danced, um, you know, the uh, traditional holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Fourth of July, you know, the barbecues, all that kind of stuff. Um, we were always, it was, you know, I was, I grew up on the south side of Chicago and that is a a, a a very hot cultural hub you know yes. it's 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 a cultural hub that i'm just really thankful that i had that opportunity to um i was again thankful that i was born and raised there because right. it taught me a lot it gave me a very solid foundation in terms of who i am as an african woman born right. here in america right. And how I got to Tucson, I will never know. <laughs> I, mean, I love I don't think it though. Any of us do. Every minute of it. I am Tucsonian official now. <laughs> right. I don't think any of us really understand how we actually got here, but we're here. Um, but let's talk about that because you talked about Chicago being like a real hub for culture um, and also your love of dance. So let's let's kind of break that down a little bit. How important is it to you that African dance be preserved not only as a tradition, but also as culture? Um, I think you don't separate the two personally, okay. um, as in terms of a tradition, we, um, it's, it's the thread that really connects us as African people, um, uh, on the continent and in, in the diaspora. It's just, it's, it's what connects us that, you know, so it's important to me that we have an understanding that the dance, the traditional dance has given birth to um not only uh culture and um folklore and stories uh religion as mm -hmm. we know it but it's it's given us such a foundation but again that foundation it was you know that that was taken from us um as we became enslaved here um in the diaspora and colonized in uh on the continent on the motherland right. um so it is it's 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 not even that it's 
important. It's that we're not going to be able to necessarily manifest and grow as a people if we don't begin to embrace our culture as African people born here, wherever you are, in the islands, in Barbados, like my friend Danny Diallo Hines, right. um, as um, my St. Louis uh, Better Family Life folks, uh, Deborah and Malik Ahmed, um, as, you know, my daughter and my son. My son is, uh, you know, at the University of Missouri, at Mizzou, doing football, but he understands his culture. He knows who he is. Um, and, and my daughter also just kicking off her new business, uh, BW Beauty, uh, my grandson at the University of Arizona, and all of the children. I just received an email from Marge uh, Shabrea uh, Codwell, one of the twins, uh, that not only studied with me as a child, but they performed in numerous Juneteenth celebrations. Mm -hmm. And to, for me to now look back and reflect on the growth of these young people, it's just pretty amazing. Um, um there was um we had we 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 have been the pioneers of african culture we are the premier and right. that's not taken away from helen mason with the black theater company right. in uh phoenix right. because she also is a pioneer but her focus was on theater right ours ours is still on african or an africana dance, um, African Latino dance, African dance from the Caribbean, um, from of course the, uh, the motherland and, uh, and beyond. And, and right here in Tucson, we, you know, we, our festivals here, I, you know, when I came here, I would go into classrooms and, you know, the young black children, they would look at me and, you, you know, they were ashamed. If, if, I, if, I, if I feel like I hadn't, I've done nothing else it's to raise their consciousness and make them mm -hmm. feel loved and you know that Wakanda spirit of of forever and right. that's what was real and is real important to me um and now to to now with everything that's going on this current climate to be able to look around and listen to these new voices of these young people speaking so eloquently and so deliberate with a consciousness right and so I feel like there's there's still work to be done. Now, I'm not going to make like we've solved all the problems, but I know that we use dance as a weapon. And, so, um, you know, dance is, is my weapon and it can open doors. Uh, it can relax people. It can it can um, show you the fierceness and the commitment and the determination that you have. It's like, you know, um, the YWCA they asked me to do a, a panelist in their conference uh earlier this year we just beat the the uh, pandemic closure and they said that um they it was uh, i forget their exact title but i i retitled mine and i called it hired fired and rehired right because that's really what it was about you know i was hired because everybody was you know people were open and not everybody but people were open and they wanted to you know expose like they should be doing you know african-centered dance africana dance in terms of what i call it but they they weren't ready for the truth <laughs> so let's talk about they, that because you talk yeah. about um the power of dance as a weapon and i love that um news Flash, Facebook family, I too am a dancer. I danced for 11 years. I have not had the pleasure of dancing under Miss Fabia Williams yet. Not yet, right? If her knees will allow it, that will happen. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I danced for 11 years. My mother danced for ages. She was an African dancer back in New York City. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, and I love the idea as dance as a weapon, as a storytelling technique. Um, also dance as a healing agent, an agent of change, a battle cry. And with so much that is happening right now in our country, I mean, we're seeing this gorgeous, just swelling of protest and um, anger and understanding and change. And it's all happening. Where does dance fit into that for you? How does dance become um, part of the protest? What does that look like? Dance has always Ways in my mind been a a, a, a mechanism um, to communicate 
um, with our bodies, with our minds, with our spirits, with our sense of, of that insight into the future so that we can pass something down to the next generation. Mm -hmm. As a weapon, I, I really think back with the, um, you, we, we bought the, cup, uh, the, um, the break dancing here to Tucson. Mm -hmm. um, I was working um, with as a VISTA volunteer and I was working through the community food bank. Mm -hmm. And there was a man that, and I was at the then um, Donna, um, it's now called Donna Liggins. At that time it was called the Northwest Neighborhood Center. Mm -hmm. And I was working there uh, as a VISTA volunteer and there was a man named Frank and he worked at um, El Pueblo Neighborhood Center. And Frank and I used to always run into each other at the food bank and we, you know, started this conversation. You know, I had talked to him about being a dancer, being in the theater. At that time we had the Ododo Theater, which was located at 264 East Congress. Very different atmosphere than it is now on, mm -hmm. in downtown Tucson. Yeah. But Frank and I, and he, he said, well, you know, he has these um, break dancers that uh, he wanted me to see. So one day, I, you know, we arranged a meeting and in walked two Jose's, uh, uh, Ho, uh, Jesus, a uh, Hector, and uh, about maybe six little little boys. They were really small, young boys. I mean, I'm talking about eight to 10 years old. You know, we're, we're not even teens yet. And these young men, they blew me away. I tell you, when I think back on it, it was like, this amazing, I mean, they could spin on their head. They could, you know, those suicide where they land on their back, the content, you know, they had all of these d dynamic movements. And of course, the first thing I'm thinking is, um, uh, uh, who do I get out here to make sure that these kids don't hurt themselves? So we hired uh, a man from Tucson High. Um, he was a drummer, I can't think of his name, but we hired him to come over and work with these boys. I mean, once he saw how dynamic, um, I have to get his name because he, he was a teacher at Tucson High, I do remember, but we asked him to come over and join us. And, and then we began to, you know, I, would, I was in South, a lot of these children lived in South Tucson. Uh, I would go pick them up and we had what we call battles. So mm. we would go and, you know, their parents, they, they were translating for me. Their parents did not speak English as a first language or maybe not at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, it really began to reflect on me how important that was. And I hope I'm asking, but this, this, is, this is, again, this is healing, this is battle for me because what I realized earlier this year is when, we lo when I lost the mother of one of the children, uh, Daryl Sean Chapel, that when we lost uh, Joyce Chapel, and I realized that a mother had allowed me to take her child to New York to mm -hmm. Chicago, to LA, to Detroit, you know, and all over Arizona, all over Tucson. I'm talking about Sierra Vista. And so did these other parents. And at that time we did not have cell phones. And the mothers, you know, they would give me them tamales. Girl, I had all kinds of tamales come the holidays, especially, but they would give us something to eat and we would stop at sell at the, at the uh, pay phones and make sure, especially if we were running late. So. For me, that's healing. These are young people in our community that, you know, I mean, I just spoke to two of them uh, recently because I wanted them involved in the Juneteenth Festival mm -hmm. and um, with Mark Williams and Donnie Hilliard. Donnie went on to um, actually dance and perform with us. But Mark, what happened was these young people, these boys that uh, we met, they were really kicking butt. We were in Elkhorn Mall and battling and people would always, you know, make these $20 here donations to us. And I invested that in our, our, our dress, our cotton, you know, not costumes, but in their, their crew, <laughs> it's a different, different terminology there, but they, uh, we, we, um, we, and then we came up with a name, but we invested that money into uh, advertising them, renting the space, and just other things that we needed, feeding the children, um, and again, hiring uh, Zebo. that's his name, the, the gymnast that came in to make sure these children were okay. And do I need to slow down for the interpreter? <laughs> She's doing her job over there, I love it. But um, we would go, and, and the, these young people that we were calling the Lejinbu, um icebreakers, 
um, that's when we came together and we ran into these young men, uh, Ronnie and Mark, and they were from a mountain. They mm -hmm. were from the mountain. And so that's where the first Juneteenth took place too. So um, we, we came together. And so we had these, these, uh, these younger boys with, because Mark and them and um, Donnie and them, they were driving. So, and, you know, and along, there were other break dance groups here, but we were the first to put it on at the old Elks Lodge downtown mm -hmm. in the Theatro Carmen in mm -hmm. that historic building right across uh, from not too far, a, a half a block from TCC. Right. So we were able to um, put on a show there and it was, um, it was pretty amazing. So again, that healing part of it through the dance, we know that and the battle that the uh, break dance was about not about the young, the, the gang members, you know, in the Bronx and, um, you know, in the uh, African and in the Latino communities, they're not to kill each other. You know, that it was about outdance me, you know, how, how many turns and spins and flips can you do continuations? How many can you do? So that's really what it was about. And so for me, and when I think about Capoeira, um, Moacir and Paolo, and we had this whole, and Greg, um, uh, Greg also um, was a part of our first, we, we introduced and uh, uh, Dandy, um, Dandy Marble. These were some of our first caparistas. And mm -hmm. we introduced that in our shows here in Tucson. We were the first to do that. So it, it's, it's really, again, to, to feel that full circle coming around as uh, knowing. And it, for me, again, it was divine intervention. I, I know that this was, I, I was a business major, a major in accounting. And um, it just, I, I it was, this is long the time. Ride. <laughs> it, it was tr truly divine intervention. And Bill Lewis with the Ododo Theater, he came over and um, he called me and uh, Kay Watson and just some other wonderful people uh, to come in. And, you know, we were hired through that CETA, through the CETA program. There was money to hire. I was hired as a choreographer, dancer. Um, and um, Ada Red Austin, Mary, um, uh, Mary, um, uh, they, these were these uh, phenomenal singers and David Dean. And we just had this amazing group of people that could sing in this talent. Of course, Bernie Starks. Right, right. So gotta, gotta mention Bernie, you know, he said <laughs> I was, um, his mother and I were the only one that could call him Bernice. <laughs> Everybody else got to call him Bernie, right? But again, this was our foundation here. And so for me, that was really healing. I was coming out of the 60s here, uh, in, you know, on the south side of Chicago. And um, there was a lot going on that we were being exposed to. Uh, Southern Illinois University, SIU, the school that I was <laughs> getting ready to attend. You know, we were going through um, uh, Jackson State and Kent State and, um, you know, those killings. And we, um, you know, SIU had closed down. So that was, again, a, it was opening up some doors for me. I mean, we did end up going to school, but, you know, I immediately joined the Black uh, Student uh, Union there, association, so that we could, you know, I could continue to um, reinforce what, you know, my consciousness about whatever was going on in our communities directly. What were the scholars talking about? Asa Hilliard, Dr. Hilliard, Dr. Ray Winbush, um, uh, the, the wonderful people um, that I was able to um, not only study with, but also travel. My first trip to Africa, right. I had dreamt about it. I had cried about it. I had it in my dreams. And the minute I met Dr. Asa Hilliard, um, all that changed. He was talking about going to Africa. And um, I went. We went to ancient Kemet, which people know uh, as Egypt, but it's it's a lot of healing in in, in all of this. Right. Um, understanding the dance styles that we do with uh, Sa, that um, the man that I you know I say he brought the djembe here to us. 
um, Papa Aziz Ahmed, Kevin Aziz um, White is his name, uh, that bought the djembe here to um, Arizona. So is there's that, a lot of healing. Is that the style of African dance that you teach, the West African? I teach West African dance. So we teach dance, West African dance that um, derives from the old empire of Mali. Mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of that is um, started uh, with uh, more charm. I think most of us know Akon, right? With yes. his father, <laughs> yes. you know, and uh, started these African dance uh, conferences in East St. Louis, Illinois, right? Okay. <laughs> and so I was blessed to be a part of not only the first, but some, uh, but many of them for many years until the, the Dunham conferences took over and more charm stopped that. But um, more charm, Akon's uh, father, uh, who uh, Catherine Dunham bought to um, uh, bought to the United States from Senegal. Um, he started those, and of course, you know my studies with uh, in Chicago with the uh, Montu Dance Theater. I took a few classes with um, the mother. I would call her the mother of African dance, um, Darlene Blackburn, and um, you know. Um, I would go to these conferences and I didn't have that much money and people don't believe it, but you know, when you want to do something, you just get up off your butt and you do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I got, I had enough money to get my airplane ticket. I had enough money to pay for the conference, but I didn't have any place to stay twice. This happened. <laughs> I got off the airplane and, in um, uh, at the Conqueron Conference <laughs> in Washington, D.C., in Chocolate City, right? And I went to the conference, and I, like, did not know. And I happened to run into a woman named Edria Johnson, Tucson's Edria Johnson, Black Woman's Task Force, Edria Johnson. And she didn't really know me, but, you know, we knew each other that, you know, just that, you know, she knew I was in the dance, and she let me... Let, you know, she let me stay in her hotel during the whole conference and uh, provided that bed, that couch, that floor for me to sleep on. Right. And the second time it happened, there's another African dance company called Najwa. Mm -hmm. Najwa comes out of that Harlem Renaissance, the Chicago Renaissance area. She danced with the Ellen, uh, Duke Ellingtons of the world, but, you know, that background out of Chicago. And Najwa... She, uh, you know, she didn't really know me. I knew Andrea and um, Malaika. I knew the two of them. But again, um, Adria wasn't there this second time. And again, they opened up their door, their, their hotel room. And, um, you know, they give you a place to stay, a place, a safe place to mm -hmm. sleep uh, for the, during, during the duration of the conference. So I was blessed. I, I, you know, I was not only comfortable and safe, you know, I was with my people. Right. And, you know, we have to understand that, you know, we hear about all these things that happen to, you know, especially, you know, I grew up in, in, in St. Louis is my second home, but I grew up on the South side of Chicago. And that was um, very instrumental in, in terms of establishing my love of my people, my respect for my people. Right. Well, let's talk things happen, but go ahead. Let's talk about that because it is no secret that Tucson has a teeny tiny black community. Um, I always say we're just, we're 4% strong, <laughs> right? Just 4% strong. Um, who do you see coming in to take your classes? Is it us or is it Tucson's white and Latinx community? When I first started at Parks and Rec, I had a very much, um, um, it was a predominantly um, a white um, classes. I was having a good time. They were having a good time. Then I turned around and asked my boss, you know, where's the black community? So she sent me to Santa Rosa Parks, to La Reforma, the projects over there. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met the foundation of our company. This is where I met Willie Ray Bell and Daryl Sean Chapel. And it, again, we, we took off from there. Um, we had uh, Norwood Rainey, uh, Talivu Jadi, um, Ralph Drew at the time, that was his name, uh, Ed Good, 
Jinx Chapel. These were our drummers. We had some of the most amazing drummers that you want to just uh, even imagine uh, with the West African dance that we were doing. And, you know, we, again, we were, they were more Afro-Cuban in terms of their style. Again, I have to go back to the Dunham technique, you know. <laughs> um, so um, this is where um, we started there. And then, um, again, I, I even have photos of, of Wanda and um, uh, some of our other young da our dancers at that time. And it was almost, all, our company started off as a, a almost totally uh, black and um, uh, African Latino company, Afro-Mexican children. Um, they were uh, uh, children that started with our company right. and uh, it, almost exclusively. That was our company. Everybody was in, in, uh, welcome to join and uh, to come in and see what we were doing and learn and grow and begin to understand how important it is to respect us and our culture, the foundation of world culture. Right. I feel like oh. myself being an Afro-Latin woman now, I'm like, I need to go and take some of these classes. I don't know if my body will let me, but I'm surely going to try. <laughs> well, it's time. It is time. It is definitely time. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk, to you and talk about Juneteenth. Yeah. Um, and not let this day go by without discussing it. Um, for the folks that don't know, although by now you should know, you should just know. Uh, today is June 19th, which marks the last, or the day that the last slaves found out they were finally free, a whole two and a half years after the fact. Um, and of course, in the Black community, this is a huge cause for celebration, as well it should be. Um, what are some tangible ways? and? Before I get into this next question, I want to preface this to say that we see a lot of companies now saying, you know, we're going to give our employees this day off, you know, we're going to make it a holiday, things of that nature. Um, Tucson as a whole has always celebrated Juneteenth within the Black community. It's never been a citywide celebration. It feels like it's always kind of been something that we've organically put together ourselves. Um, what do you think are some tangible ways that the city of Tucson, i.e. administration, um, not the residents, can not only commemorate Juneteenth, um, but also honor the Black people of the community, our heritage, our ancestry, and the contributions to the community? Well, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> you got it going on. I love your questions too. Thank you, uh, Adiba. It's a, it's really a pleasure here. Um, we are again. We're a small community. In Juneteenth, um, in 1970, at Vista del Pueblo Park, this was this was my first uh, celebration because again, I'm you know I'm coming from the south side of Chicago. We're looking for the black community. Where are our people? Um, coming, you know, in from Chicago. And it was our first celebration here, either in 72 or 73. And it had started, Morris Doty and a man named Bobby. I, I don't remember Bobby exactly, but I definitely remember uh, Morris Doty. And um, they started this celebration, uh, you know, just as like a, a family gathering, picnic out in Vista del Pueblo uh, Park on San Marcos. This is at the foot of A Mountain. Okay. And um, it continued to grow. By the time I got there, it was major. Um, as you'll see on our virtual uh, video, I, you know, I called on the man I knew I needed to call on, Dr. Johnny Bowens, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 20 years chairperson of the Junete Juneteenth Festival. And I asked him to Johnny, come on, come on. We need to, this is our 50th anniversary celebration. That's a milestone. And, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about not only the oldest celebration in Arizona, but we're talking about the oldest national black celebration of freedom right. and liberation and of emancipation, right. you know, and, and, and just to check that too, we were not slaves, we were enslaved. And that's really, really important to say, because when we were forced to come from Africa, you know, we had nations of people. We had uh, empires, we had governmental systems, we had uh, 
you know, an agricultural systems that we were the foundation of. We had, you know, um, astrological um, um, uh, foundations with the Dogon people and, and many other scientific and um, uh, literary and, uh, you know, the, the um, University of San Corre. I mean, it was full of these books that people don't even realize these, uh, these ta that were saved as a matter, that's a whole nother story, that were saved by this man that knew with these just these jihad and, and um, that were coming in there, um, that they were trying to destroy these evidence just like they did in, um, you know, in Alexandria at the library there in ancient Kemet. You know, people don't, you know, shooting off noses and destroying our documents. Those documents could be helping us, you know, with this pandemic that we have going on now. Mm -hmm. You know, these were these were old, these were years and centuries and, you know, original foundations of studies and observation of people um, that, you know, you know, when, when and one of the things I remember reading a long time ago and when you watch a, when you watch an animal um, by a plant and those animals or those birds and, you know, they've fallen dead, you know that there's something poisonous about that and you don't want to consume that. Right. So, I mean, we're talking about years of observation and, you know, after you plant something, agriculture, you know, those agricultural communities. Um, whew, and, the you know, I mean, things that we have built. Right. <laughs> And I mean, you know, we, we, we look at ourselves as these hut people. I mean, those were, that was significant too. You know, if you're living in, you know, like climate like Tucson, you know, like you have Adobe here, you right. had huts there, right? <laughs> so it was significant, you know, it was very important um, to, to understand that. But Tucson, um, I've always had black people in my classes, in my company, um, because it's important. We're doing African centered dance. I've right. always welcomed those wonderful people that have been respectful mm -hmm. of me, mm -hmm. of our culture, that are here to learn, that have something that they want to give and grow with. Mm -hmm. I've always been, uh, you know, the Lena's, you know, the Amy's, uh, uh, not only white people, but non-white people. I mean, I've had a lot of, I had a young Mexican woman that I ran into, I forgot where I was just recently, maybe at this, probably at the grocery store, because I don't go out too much these days. But she, um, she said, uh, you're Barbia, aren't you? And I was just, you know, and she says, well, you know, I danced with you when I was little. I was, you know, I performed with you. I forgot where she said where but I perform with you and I just want to thank you. And you, I get that often. It's at that time, you know, as an elder in our community yep. that has been very adamant and dedicated to laying a foundation right. that um, you get that now. Um, so it's important, um, but yes, we always have people. Um, I have young people that are now, um, I've, you know, Tira, that especially Tira Olson, that is, she's been studying with me since she was three. And um, she has, she went over to me with Choya and has been my rehearsal s assistant uh, with not only her peers, um, she's in high school also, but uh, with her peers, but also with our young, young children. She has been my rehearsal assistant, my dance captain, and she's um, a, a freshman uh, in high school and she, uh, she auditioned into her uh, to the highest level in her in high school in the, in the dance company there who has a very reputable person uh, that is in charge of that also um, that I've known for years and you know they didn't even know she was involved with us so, so right. that really made me understand that we not only reflect on um, we not only reflect on um, that community dance that we do, you know, the one that you need to join, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And some of you other young folks out there, right? Yes. But, um, cause I'm, I'll dance everybody, right? <laughs> right. I, I believe this, I do believe this. <laughs> but uh, we also train them for professional stage. And because I've been at the University of Arizona also for the last 18 years in the school of dance. And I, you know, so there's, 
many communities, you know, uh, that I've been able to to touch bases with and be a part of. And and you can't, you know, Pima Community College, um, Barclay Goldsmith, and, mm-hmm. you know, that whole crew there, I, I just can't even begin to say how important that was in terms of opening doors, opening doors. And this is not so I can mention your name in an interview, but knowing that you are that person, these wonderful people, uh, Jory Hancock, who said that, you know, it's time, it's time that we have uh, an, another um, African-centered dance. You know, I don't know too many people, but last year, uh, Tucson Unified School District's uh, Department of um, Pedagog- Pedagogy and Instruction, their department nominated us for a national award that we received uh, the National uh, Association for Multicultural Education out of Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just, you know, to reflect on that was just really important to me. It was really important to me because, it was, again, it was those dancers from the U of A, you know, and, and, and that have created this, um, this mentoring of the young people to, to, to work harder and un- to begin to understand, understand the level that you, you know, that time, that energy, that focus that you have to put in to become and raise your skill level. Mm-hmm. And then I come along again with that cultural foundation right? so that they really understand we're not just kicking our legs and jumping and hopping. You know, we have to understand, you know, that break you know, that starts us, that stops us, that brings in the music, that brings in the dancers. We really have to understand how intricate it is. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, it's it's just, you know, Pima Community College was a very strong foundation because again, Bill Lewis with Ododo Theater and Barclay Goldsmith, especially their, um, um, you know, Todd, um, who I think is still over there of, of, that, old, of that crowd from there, um, but, we, you know, there was some important, we toured, you know, Albert Soto. Right. Just some wonderful people that, you know, were there that helped us grow and develop ourselves and our skills and our talent. Um, you know, Esther, I, I just think of just these wonderful people um, that uh, we grew with here so in you, Tucson. You have a very long history here in Tucson. And I, I think that, I mean, like I said, I met you gosh, when I was 11 or 12, like 30 years ago. Um, so I've always known that you were here and existed. Don't beat me for not having been in your classroom yet. I'm getting there. <laughs> I love that yet. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. As I have as- your email now, so no excuse. <laughs> so people need to know about the Juneteenth. And there's a lot of history that is on our um um, the uh, Facebook web page, Barbia Williams Performing Company. We also have a Juneteenth uh, event page right. uh, that gives you all the up-to-date information. And I really want to take a minute and ask people to, um, we have now a, um, a texting service so that, you know, any update information, mm-hmm. and this is, um, you want to go into your text and where you would put someone's uh, phone number and name and phone number there, you want to text 565 25. I'm going to write that. 565 25. And then when you go down to the where you have uh, in that area where you would actually, you know, text a message, say, hey, how you doing? Mm-hmm. You want to text in B L K. Okay. C U L. That's B as in boy, L as in uh, Larry, K as in um, uh, kangaroo, (laughs) C as in cat, U as in unicorn, and L as in Larry. It's like an acronym for black culture, but all you text in is B L K C U L. Okay. And with that, you will uh, be into a new network mm-hmm. that will uh, keep you informed on what is going on in Tucson's 
black community here. And also, you know, as we expand it on, because, you know, we are connected in, in, in our Sierra Vista, our um, uh, Casa Gran, and, and of course our Phoenix area, because, you know, there's a lot of, of um, communities in Phoenix, but our Phoenix area communities about what's going on with the black culture. So I don't want to look at us as 4%. I want us to look at ourselves as a global community here America. in America. America, because that's what we want to connect ourselves to. So Barbia, well, thank you for giving that information, 56525 BLKCUL. I actually tried it out myself and I immediately got a text back that said, welcome team keeping the culture alive invites you to stay connected through our interactive system, TBEN, Tucson Black Empowerment Network. You have, opted, you have opted into Each One Reach One, our solution to keeping you connected to Black Tucson. I love this. I love the people involved, not only my daughter, Bia Williams, but uh, another mastermind, Treon Coleman, um, um, who are they're just wonderful young people that are you know that again they they've care, they're carrying those torches and uh, that we're passing to them as our as our elders but we are online tomorrow pima community college has really really come through and you're also going to hear a little bit about the southwest folk life alliance and dr griffith because he is another foundation south tucson meet yourself was another foundation of us again growing here uh in tucson but we are from 8.30, you'll, again, you'll, you'll hear Dr. Bowens giving us some of the history and foundation about Tucson's 50th anniversary celebration. And you will also have um, you know, some fun instrumentation that mm -hmm. we added in there. And you have another man, because his mother was um, Rosemary Mills, Scotty Mills was, uh, you, we, we have some surprises, what we call back in the day. Okay. There is a 27 year old love story. And all I'm gonna say is guess who? Guess who? Who do you think <laughs> might have 27 years later and how that black love is black wealth has manifested here in Tucson and in Phoenix and in Mexico actually too. Okay, because they're doing just wonderful things. So we really wanna talk, we have a wonderful clip of that love story where you actually hear about it. It didn't happen at um, Vista del Pueblo. It happened at June t at, um, at Kennedy Park. It's, it was um, a 27 year old love story. And I'm, all I'm gonna say is guess who? But we yeah, have these tidbits and of course we're gonna dance. We have a wonderful program with our children um, starting off, kicking off at nine o'clock. Um, at 10 o'clock, we have Dance as a Weapon. Again, we have those some of our professional dancers, again, from the U of A uh, School of Dance. Um, and anyone else that would like to kick in, we are still, by this evening, we will have the exact format. We have a YouTube channel with Barbia Williams Performing Company spelled out. You'll okay. see our logo on it, so please subscribe you'll know that you're in the right channel so that you can get immediately our live, um, not only will be live on Facebook, but live on YouTube also tomorrow. Tell, tell us again, where is this happening tomorrow? This is happening at the studio, the BWPC Dance and Art Academy. So everything is online, everything is virtual. We have okay. some people that are pre-recorded, you know, uh, we also have some people that uh, we will be tuning into <laughs> online, okay. but Pima College has us covered. They, oh, they, they it's the dynamic uh, tech crew from there has us covered. So we're really excited about that. Mm -hmm. And um, so please, again, text in that number. You should be getting a flyer pretty soon if you haven't already um, from uh, again, TKCA, uh, Team Keeping the Culture Alive. Yes. That's who is uh, instrumental in working with that. And I hope I haven't forgotten anybody, but we've got a really, um, like I said, we've got a powerhouse. Uh, we've got hip hop dance. Um, again, we've got our professional dancers. These are young Alvin Ailey, Dance Theater Harlem level dancers that you're gonna see. And they've, al they've already come in and we've you know set the um, studio up so that you know when you see the golden screen, you'll know you're in the right place, right? 
Well, this sounds fantastic, Rabia. This sounds absolutely fantastic. I hope that anyone watching definitely goes to your YouTube channel tomorrow and checks it out. Um, are there any last thoughts that you want to leave our Facebook family with? There's an, a group of uh, uh, acapella group of black women called Sweet Honey in the Rock. Yes. And uh, they are not only my favorite, they are another inspiration and uh, foundation for our work. Uh, they say, um, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers. We are our grandfather's dreaming. We are the breath of the ancestors. We are the spirit of God. And you will see that dance tomorrow by some of our young people. Yes, yes. All right. So again, Adiba and the Southwest Folklife Alliance, Leah, Kimmy, uh, translators that I'm just meeting. Uh, thank you so much. I know you all will shout us out and let people know that our evening event at the park at Quincy Douglas has been canceled. Right. We are real concerned that there has been, as of this morning, we got the, um, the information from the mayor uh, who's looking after us right. and also Parks and Rec who have, uh, you know, there's now, you if you're not wearing a mask, you can get a $50 fine and if, or you have to do some community service if you get a citation. So right. we really want to, again, go on a BWPC. We have that information out there so people can keep in touch with, make sure that you um, do that texting so that you can keep up with what's going on in the black cultural community here in Tucson and, about, and beyond. All right, thank you so much, Rabia. Thank you. All right, bye-bye everybody. Bye now.